Welcome to our webinar on biomechanical testing trends. I'm Carolyn Lowell with Bone Zone, and I appreciate you joining us for our discussion about biomechanical testing trends. As engineers, you understand that biomechanics important role in developing innovative implants. And of course, testing technology plays a pivotal role in ensuring that your product functions as it was meant to. Today, we have a really great presentation on how to incorporate 3D digital image correlation and CT scanning into your testing. And through research, imagery, and videos, and in-depth orthopedic examples, you're going to gain knowledge about how this technology works and its specific applications. Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor of today's webinar, Trillion Quality Systems, for sharing their expertise with us. Trillion offers digital image correlation systems and consulting services for numerous fields across North America. For orthopedic engineers, Trillion Systems can assist with micromotion measurements between bones and implants, joint dynamics and motion capture, strain quantification, tendon repair studies, those are just to name a few. And you'll get to see some of those applications in action today. Our Trillion expert today is Justin Bushensky. He is Technical Account Manager at Trillion's Great Lakes Regional Office. Justin graduated from Ferris State University in 2007. He has been working in the automotive-related technology field for seven years and uses his previous experience in the field of secondary education to build relationships in higher education, research development, and manufacturing industries. Also joining us today is Elise Martin, who is a biomechanics engineer at UBMD Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Dr. Martin received her biomedical engineering doctorate from SUNY University at Buffalo. She has been working to develop various research, research and analysis techniques to better understand and improve various orthopedic implants. And she has a focus on reverse and anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty. And you will, you will get to see some of her research during today's presentation. We appreciate Justin and Elise joining us today. You, our audience, have opportunities to ask them questions. We will pause for Q&A about halfway through the presentation, and then we will offer another Q&A at the end. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. Justin, I am going to hand it over to you to start your presentation. Uh, hello and welcome, and uh, thank you so much for that nice introduction. I do appreciate that. Um, I'm uh, excited to be here today to discuss a promising next chapter in the field of biomechanics research. I'll be showcasing some real life applications developed by our team, drawing from experience, our own experience, and discuss some current examples of how this technology can be applied across the industry. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. I work for Trillion, an American engineering firm. It's been in business for the last 20 years. I specialize in the development of optical 3D measurement and analysis tools. We help our customers with application development and consulting services and turnkey system deployment. We're a growing business with our headquarters in Philadelphia and our offices throughout the US, you can see here. Each office keeps systems on hand and supports businesses locally, visiting for service work and for training. We're an exclusive North American testing distributor for GOM, a Zeiss company, as you can see at the logo at the very top there. And GOM develops the software and the industrial systems, and Trillion supports its customers and their work locally. Here's the GOM lineup of measuring systems as you can see here. Today, we're going to concentrate on the Aramis and the Zeiss GOM CT scanner. So uh, let's get started. Let's uh, first discuss Aramis. It's an optical strain gauge for full field strain and displacement measurements. It's a pair of cameras and a blue light up above. Aramis uses triangulation between the cameras to track either target dots or speckle pattern along the surface of your specimen. We use target dots, lightweight stickers, so you can see here, uh, anywhere you stick a dot would be a 3D coordinate. And the cameras will capture displacements in all directions, along with velocity and acceleration in all directions. In the example we see here, there's a narrow prosthesis, a, a blade for the prosthesis there. 
and our objective is to determine the stiffness of that blade. In order to isolate the movement of the blade, we place target dots on the knee as a reference. So although the whole body is moving, our measurement is a relative displacement of the blade to the knee. And so uh, in this way, uh, we can uh, use a rigid body motion compensation, which basically means that you can bump the cameras and still get a good data set. Alternatively, we can use speckle pattern uh, on surfaces to create thousands of tiny dots. Accordingly, we get thousands of uh, optical strain gauges, totally non-contact. These gauges don't care about material or temperature. This is just off the shelf standard aerosol paint, black and white. The software automatically identify and track the high contrast of the pattern or the target dot. So with strain field like this at this resolution, you can uh, truly understand your specimen under load. So this, this is the, the nuts and bolts of what we'd be doing with Aramis. It's not hard to see Aramis's advantages, biomedical testing, uh, mechanical testing, uh, some of the materials are very hard to predict, and they have especially complex geometries. Strain gauges are sometimes too large for biological tissues. Extensometers have sometimes uh, induced micro damage to the biological specimen. So uh, there's a lot of uh, reasons why you would think about using us. Uh, the Aramis collects values all along the surface, the whole entire surface that you can see. So it's collecting thousands of locations in a non-contact fashion. So you get uh, you know, no user variability. In the, in the data example you see on your screen here, we can inspect strain gradients and concentrations and, and pull out automatically the minimums and maximums of both principal and directional strains. This is already accepted by many materials labs and is certified as a class A extensometer following ASTM standards. Aramis has a huge potential in testing of soft tissues, implant testing for FEA, and because of its Aramis sensitivity, micromotion analysis projects. You're going to see some of that today. So we're non-contact. So uh, I mentioned before, uh, no user variability. So this makes us more accurate, far more accurate than, uh, say, for instance, a foil strain gauge. We give full field measurement. So you gain a holistic insight and anything, uh, think of something that's inhomogeneous or anisotropic, we're gonna work great for that. Also, if you have, uh, you need to identify a crack for crack initiation or tracking a crack propagation, it's fantastic for that. We also collect strain and displacement at the same time as I was showing the previous screen. We're very flexible uh, so that uh, just change your lenses and you can change your field of view. We're material independent so from implants to bones to tissues, we work great. And we measure from static that before and after style photos, uh, deformation, static deformation, to high cycle fatigue that can last days, to hammer strikes that uh, can last seconds. We, uh, we can actually measure vibration and we've been used in the past to monitor the structural integrity of bone after fracture healing, say for instance and we are critical for FEA validation. So Aramis brings simulation closer, ever closer to reality than ever before with just a single iteration of our, uh, our acquisition. So um, that's a nice introduction to Aramis. Let's get into some uh, Aramis biomechanical applications before we introduce the CT and, and kind of put it all together. So this is the rundown of what we're gonna be covering. So let's jump into some tendon studies. We do a lot of different uh, types of studies, especially analyzing gait analysis. Uh, we work with a lot of shoe companies and sportswear customers. We're often analyzing bodies' movements during activities. But this first application involves a little bit deeper of a look. And so here we have uh, an in vitro study of the biomechanical behavior of a human cadaver Achilles tendon. And uh, maybe you've heard this before uh, out on the basketball court but it actually makes a popping noise as it, as it breaks, uh, taking a failure here, of course. It's very painful to watch, but if you pay careful attention, this is a strain measurement, uh, not to the concentration of strain at the very top, which is really prevalent. You can see that straining. But if you look uh, down below, there's a quick propagation of strain towards the bottom just before rupture. And so this is a, a really nice example of uh, the type of information you get when you can shoot it uh, when you can acquire holistically and really understand your material. 
Another cadaver uh, tendon that we have here, this is a, a time repair model. This is under cyclic load. And the purpose of this test was to compare biomechanical properties of tendon repairs. So we've divided between left and right, and these are two different types of tendon repairs that are being compared. And so um, from this measurement, we were able to arrive at yield strength, uh, gap formation and failure, comparing the types of tendon repairs uh, between the two. And you can see uh, on, the, on the right side, we've got a nice diagram showcasing those points as they're plotted down on the left. Each time we plot a point, it becomes essentially an optical strain gauge. And ultimately, this testing was uh, useful in identifying and validating lower rupture rates for certain tendon repairs. Again, this holistic style of testing uh, gives you so much more data all at once. So that's a pretty nice uh, looking test, a couple of tests that we've seen. Let's move on now uh, into implant testing. There's been quite an evolution in hip replacement research and Aramis has played a, a, a large factor in that. And so you can see our speckle pattern on this hip here. And uh, we're used really heavily in the validation of numerical simulation. And we've been used for that direct comparison of the calculated strain fields of the finite element uh, to the implant. So both John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory and Mayo Clinic use Aramis and they find their finite element models uh, of implant bone constructs should be evaluated for their validity against mechanical tests wherever it is possible. And with experimental equivalents obtained using Aramis, like this human femur on the left, you can get these uh, great looking compressive loads and, and run all kinds of studies. So this is a compression gradient of strain, inspecting the implant's deformation under load. Here we see the comparison of the FEA on the top right with the real mechanical behavior obtained with Aramis on the bottom right. In the past, we've also been used as an evaluation tool for biomechanical behavior comparative studies of dissimilar hip design, similar to the, uh, the comparison of the tendon repair. We've also done some hip design studies as well. So when you're shooting in these holistic fashions, you can align easily uh, with your finite elements and compare against each other in, in nice ways. Let's now turn to a couple of different surgical techniques. Uh, the first one is an impact test that involves a hammer strike. This is a high speed event that needs to be understood to best control for implant placement. Some orthopedic surgery necessarily requires that pieces be implanted using hammer blows and understanding the variability of force ranges and the durations of those blows is absolutely critical for balancing the stability of the implant with, without risking that bone fracture. And so the objective of this simulated test was to show our ability to monitor the hammer strike, including the six degrees of freedom, and bullseye the location temporally and spatially when the hammer precisely hits the impactor. So let's go ahead and take a look. Here we are in Trillion Labs with the high-speed Aramis setup on a tripod with lighting mount mounted above. You'll see those lights up there. And for this project, we optically scan the hammer and the impactor we're going to be using. You'll see our AE use that. We scanned them ahead of time to get their actual meshes. We wanted their actual shapes so that we could tack them to the target dots we're using. I explained those target dots before. And with them tacked together, the Aramis will track the target dots so the mesh will move along with it, as you can see here in this mesh tracking. This is important because it allows us to track three-dimensional parts even when we cannot see them. And uh, if we know where the target dots are at, then we know where in space the mesh is at. Here we have a displacement measurement. We're measuring length change between the hammer and the impactor. The Z direction is pointed up towards the hammer and becomes zero in the diagram on the bottom as the hammer hits. We selected a point on the hammer to track velocity, and this time I'll call your attention to the Y direction, which is the center diagram, directed positively to the right. The hammer starts out at 1.7 meters per second, then quickly swings negative in the Z direction. To understand the six degrees of freedom, we use the impactor as a reference, again using that rigid body, and monitored the hammer's rotations at impact. You can see most of the rotation is in the Y direction after the hammer impacts. Take a, uh, a little bit closer of a look at the trajectory. We can understand exactly the route the hammer travels and see some of that bounce back after it uh, strikes. So we really understand the motion of anything we wanna see. We can also project the hammer mesh 
in its relation to the impactor. So we're tracking it to see where in time the two meshes meet physically at that strike position. We actually see the two meshes as they, as they come together and right when they touch, we get a bullseye impact point and we can precisely locate that uh, temporally as well. It's pretty cool. And then we have got a nice looking measurement there. So that was pretty fast. We went through that very fast. Uh, so let's slow down a little bit uh, and investigate a ladder procedure, a procedure used to treat recurrent shoulder dislocations with a bone graft. You can see the bone graft screwed in here. This procedure is performed for patients whose shoulder is very unstable, dislocates often, becomes damaged over time, dislodges more and more, results in a lot of bone loss and uh, forces the procedure. To restore the rigidity to the shoulder and prevent it from dislocating further, a surgeon will graft bone into place, often using screws to fix it into place. Ultimately, the goal is to have improved stiffness in the shoulder. So uh, this test was an investigation into what fixing method worked best for the least amount of deformations into the bone segment and the connecting shoulder blade. And this was done with artificial bone material. You can see in the red square down below there. And we conducted a comparison across different fixation techniques for motion and rotation analysis. And we set out to detect the areas uh, with the largest deformation. So lots of different uh, inspections being made here. Of course, we're shooting in this holistic manner again, so we're gonna be able to make all those types of inspections. We use target dots on the screws for displacement information and the speckle patterning on the bone for strain analysis. Uh, there's cyclic loading on the bone segment with the two screws until we have ultimate failure of the part. You can see at the very end here of the video. It just uh, starts to peel back and break. There you go. And the yellow box here, you can see we have the strain analysis on the artificial bone. In the purple dots, the purple target dots, you remember these are just sticker dots we put on. Uh, we're using these as reference for our measurement. So we put these dots down on the shoulder, and this is our rigid body motion compensation. You might remember I mentioned it earlier. It's a feature in our software that allows us to remove global motion from our measurement and isolate the movement of the, of the fixture. The red dots are the target dots on the screws, you can see there, and the yellow dots are the target dots on the humerus bone that we saw earlier that was loading cyclically. So hopefully this all kind of makes sense now. So let's take, a, let's take a closer examination. Here we have the major strain analysis, which shows concentration of strain near the top screw just before failure. Run that through once more so you can see that. And we've got a couple of points plotted down here. Our software is very easy to work with. We plot down points and then we uh, and, uh, can ask it to inspect for uh, principal or directional strains. Uh, and uh, so here we've uh, inspected for major strain and the software automatically diagrams the strain in time for us at these points. On the right, you can see the red arrow headed over to the graph. We see in point two, the green line in the top graph, it's experiencing higher strain levels, uh, about 0.5% more strain during peak load. And you, we have the load being brought in at the bottom. Of course, we always like to uh, correlate all our data together. And we have a nice controller that bring in up to eight different channels of data to bring it all and sync, sync it together. So uh, another way we can visualize the results is to look at the major strain direction arrows. So we see that flow of strain. Um, you can see the compressive deformation where we have the punch. It's just transforming the load onto the bone segment right there. Uh, pretty cool looking visual. Next, we have the motion analysis on the two screws. The target dots on the screws enable us to look at the six degrees of freedom for each one. Here we're examining the rotations in the Z direction that's towards the screen. Let's take a closer look at the comparison between these screw rotations. So this is an interesting analysis. Let's look to the diagram on the right to understand it a bit more. The top screw is shown in the black line and it experiences a lower level of rotation. But the blue line at the top is representative of the bottom screw you can see that it, it experiences a higher level of rotation. And uh, remember that's in the Z direction. So that slight upward trend you can see in the, in the blue line is the screw loosening itself. And so this was actually interpreted as the bottom screw loosening 
and the top screw tightening because the screws rotate in opposite directions. So this is a very unique measurement. Very interesting to see us go through this and look at strain and displacement, look at rotation, six degrees of freedom, put it all together and really understand what's occurring as we load this artificial bone and uh, brought together really nicely there. I'm not gonna take a break and turn things over to Dr. Elise Martin for her studies in the micromotion analysis. So I'll give up the controls here. All right, thank you. Um, so today I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of my research uh, concerning biomechanical analysis of reverse total shoulder. So here's a simple illustration of the shoulder, which is a complex joint with several articulating surfaces. Our primary focus in this study is on the glenoid side of the glenohumeral joint. When we look to replace diseased shoulders, there are two main types of replacement as shown here. The anatomic total shoulder, which attempts to mimic the anatomy of the natural shoulder, and a reverse design, which uh, reverses the ball and socket in order to alter the mechanics. Both designs work to improve shoulder function and reduce pain in different scenarios. For this study, we focused exclusively on the reverse total shoulder. As you can see here, this type of implant is made up of three main components, the glenoid base plate, the glenosphere, and the humeral cup. Our goal is to quantify the, in the initial stability of the glenoid base plate. More specifically, we would like to perform analysis in the presence of a defect in the glenoid surface. This is because rotator cuff tear, which is a common indication for reverse shoulder arthroplasty, can also cause superior glenoid wear prior to corrective surgery, as shown in the figure on the right. Some current methods available to treat glenoid defect are listed here. Our focus is on the use of an augmented base plate, which is a newer solution used to compensate for bone defect by filling the defect with metal, which is built directly into the glenoid base plate component. Both clinical and biomechanical data is still limited for these new augment designs. The objective of this study is to investigate the biomechanical properties of an augmented base plate compared to a non-augmented base plate in the presence of a superior defect. So for this particular study, we utilized a 20 PCF solid rigid polyurethane foam or sawbone bone substitute, which was machined to model the glenoid either with or without a superior defect. The mechanical properties of this bone substitute mimic the cancellous bone of a typical RSA recipient. The images below show the anterior and superior view of the two types of sawbone that, we, that were machined for this project. Um, the implants were then implanted into the sawbone material and spray painted to allow for accurate 3D DIC measurements. The shoulder system utilized for this work is the comprehensive reverse shoulder system. The exact dimensions of the screws used and the selected glenosphere parameters are listed here. Each testing group included 10 samples with group A being control group with a non-augmented base plate and no defect, group B including a non-augmented base plate with defect, and group C including the augmented base plate with defect. The testing method utilized here is based on previously published work involving a cyclic application of zero to 750 newtons of force at one hertz for 5,000 cycles. The applied force is directed at a simulated 60 degree angle of abduction as indicated in the left image showing the anterior view of our setup. In this image, the glenite component with attached glenosphere is held rigidly within our support construct on the bottom and the appropriate cyclic force is applied downward by the humeral cup. The image to the right illustrates the basic setup of our system, including the actuator, load cell, specimen, and 3D DIC cameras directed at the superior edge of the sample. Data was collected in 10 cycle data sets periodically throughout the 5,000 cycle trial. Um, we utilized a 3D digital image correlation system to collect data rather than mechanical displacement gauges such as LVDTs. This allows us to track the three-dimensional position of every point on the visible surface of the construct. In this image, I have provided an example of the type of image we are able to collect with the camera system and have highlighted areas of interest, including the base plate in blue, the sawbone in green, and the support structure in purple. Although 
3D DIC provides a large data set for us to work with, we have chosen to focus on point displacement to simplify the results. These selected points are normalized to the support structure in order to provide global measurements that will have magnitudes similar to most other RSA biomechanical studies which utilize LBDTs. So firstly, here is shown the most superior point selected on the visible edge of the base plate. We are able to report the data collected from this point in multiple directions. Um, this representation of the anterior view of a sample indicates motions in the superior inferior medial lateral directions, as well as total displacement as a vector sum of the other two directions. One of the limitations of the camera system that we encountered is the ability to make direct measurements only along the visible edge of the sample. In order to account for this constraint, a process called CAD import is utilized, which allows for the alignment of a CAD model for the specific implant to the visible surface in the camera's motion capture. Using rigid body mechanics, any virtual point defined on the CAD file can be tracked. This method allows for the measurement of points, such as the tip of the implant post, which are not easily measurable using any direct measurement technique because they are embedded within the sawbone and therefore not visible without disrupting the surrounding sawbone. By being able to place points on all edges of the implant, we are able to fully define the motion of the implant as the force is applied and cycled. From the point selected on our CAD import, we can pull out the final micromotion values at cycle 5,000. Micromotion is the amount of displacement per cycle. This value is calculated as the displacement between the loaded and unloaded state for each cycle, which is relevant to the amount of loosening the implant experiences over the course of the trial. This graph illustrates the total micromotion values for the three constructs, no defect, augment, and defect, for the inferior, superior, and tip points. This of note, when examining the inferior point of the implant, the no defect case has a significantly smaller mean micromotion than the defect case. And for the superior point, the defect case has a significantly higher mean micromotion than all of the other cases. So essentially, this graph illustrates to us that the amount of mean micromotion experienced by the augmented base plate is somewhere in between the two non-augmented cases. So based on these outcomes, we can state that an augmented base plate may provide improved stability in the presence of a superior defect when compared to a non-augmented base plate. But further analysis is required to better define the extent of this potential improvement. So this testing protocol utilizes a simulated abduction protocol to test RSA glenoid base plate loosening. This type of testing attempts to mimic the types of shear and compressive forces experienced when the joint is at the angle of maximal joint reaction forces. A major advantage of this type of testing is that its simplicity allows for the continuous measurement of displacements throughout the entire test. But in order to more thoroughly measure displacements of this type of base plate, we are working to develop a system that is able to rotate the sample through an abduction arc to more accurately represent the forces experienced by the implant while still being able to continuously measure displacements. This much more complex system will also more accurately follow the guidelines put forth by the ASTM. So the current ASTM requirements for testing of RSA involve three basic stages. First, a displacement measurement is taken by applying a shear load parallel to the base plate and a compressive load perpendicular to the glenoid plane while, while the displacement of the base plate is measured in both directions. The sample is then unloaded and placed in a separate apparatus which will rotate the sample through an arc of motion. Finally, the sample is removed from this setup and the displacement measurement is repeat, repeated. The most obvious flaw of this testing technique is that displacements are only measured at the beginning and end of the test and not under anatomically relevant loading. So our system is able to follow the basic rotary requirements of the ASTM, but can also collect measurements in real time using a 3D DIC system. Here you can see a video of the humeral component being swung through 60 degrees of rotation and the associated camera image. The camera is able to capture the same important features of the construct, including the base plate, sawbone, and the support structure. 
Additionally, we can perform the same calculations and measurements as presented in the previous experiment by performing the same CAD import process to define all the points of interest. Here I have presented five cycles of example data for selected points on the CAD import with the inferior point in green, superior in point in red, and the tip point in purple. The top graph illustrates the superior inferior displacements and the bottom graph illustrates the medial lateral displacements. The gray line represents the location of the humeral component in degrees as displayed on the right vertical axis. Um, so there's a lot happening in these two graphs, but of note is that the superior inferior direction, um, both of the inferior and superior points move similarly and slightly out of phase with the humeral component. And in the medial lateral direction, the two edge points move in opposite directions, indicating a toggle of the base, make, base plate as this rotary force is applied. And in both directions, the tip point experiences less displacement. So utilization of this new system in conjunction with 3D DIC will help dramatically improve our understanding of the biomechanics of reverse total shoulder orthoplasty and will allow for future improvement and development of new RSA designs. Uh, so that is it. So thank you very much for having me. And if there's any questions, otherwise I have put my email in here. You feel free to email me if you have any further questions about this uh, research. Great, yeah, we will open it up for questions now. Um, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask at this moment, um, you know, both um, Justin and Elise, what, um, well, I guess, how, how are you fixturing the parts that you wish to scan? You don't know which one of you wants to answer that or if both of you want to answer that? I think that um, maybe uh, for Elise, she kind of had uh, her set up her fixture there uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind, of, kind of out in the open, but uh, for the things that we're doing, uh, we, we typically find ourselves on load frames, as much like Elise is here, um, for fixturing. And uh, so we, we, we can be um, out in the real world, the raw live data, or we can or we can be in a fixture. And um, as long as we see it with the 3D DIC, the Aramis, uh, then when we, can, uh, we can measure it. Yep, I mean, for most of the testing we do, we use our MTS actuator. Um, there's a few other instances where we just take pictures out and about in the lab, but for the most part, we're using the actuator and just fixing everything within that stationary structure. Great. And um, how fast can you record at? Um, I don't know what the maximum rate is for the Aramis, but we've been using, we collect images at 10 Hertz for our studies and that gives us a reasonable um, data collection. The Aramis can go up to as fast as cameras can go. And so um, there's really not a, a, a stop point. That sounds slippery. It sounds like I'm giving <laughs> kind of a slippery answer here um, because as you go up in sampling rate, you will decrease your pixel size and you'll have to be forced to lower your field of view. Um, but our integrated systems go up to 2000 frames per second. And then beyond that, uh, we can find a system that uh, perhaps could capture uh, the, the transient event you're trying to uh, sample at. It just uh, would depend on a number of different factors. Um, but yeah, the I guess, uh, uh, off the cuff, the sky is the limit as far as speed goes. Great. Um, Justin, would you like to continue your presentation? Yeah. Um, let's see if I can go ahead and share my screen without PowerPoint crashing this time. <laughs> and uh, go ahead and pop it up. Okay, good stuff. You know, thank you very much, Elise. Your your research is uh, really interesting, and it looks like you're using Aramis in a in a great way. So um, appreciate your your, your uh, study there, and uh, hope to work with you more. Um, I'd like to turn our attention to CT scanning, and Zeiss and Gohm have developed a true metrology tool with their latest CT scanner. So um, let's go ahead and take a, a quick look at that, and I'll introduce the CT scanner to you, which is basically a 3D X-ray. 
a 225 kilovolt x-ray source that can handle specimens up to 400 millimeters. And here you can see its small footprint. It fits into a, a room here. Of course, it has to be a specially made area for a CT to be placed into, but you can see the workstation here that controls the CT and the software and the hardware were designed together. And so um, you can conduct analysis in real time. That's very different from other CT scanners, by the way. Many others require uh, multiple other software, sometimes two or three different softwares. Um, but there's three main development goals of the Zeiss GOM CT. The highest resolution, to have the highest resolution, highest accuracy, and the best usability of a CT scanner. And to that end, uh, uh, the, uh, the possible visualization of the, the CT uh, is to, to be able to see surface defects as small as 1.2 microns, you can see here, and that's 20 times smaller than, than a human hair. So quite small, so this is the highest resolution. I, I say high, highest resolution, but what I mean is within the space of 225 kilovolt, that's at, at that source uh, in that space, we do have the highest resolution currently. Um, and uh, as far as the highest accuracy, uh, you can see here, we've had a third party study uh, to compare and contrast us against our competitors. And the Zeiss Comb CT is found to be the most accurate in that same 225 kilovolt space. You can see the deviation here for uh, accuracy. And then finally, usability. And uh, so for uh, usability, uh, we developed a five axis positioning table um, for processing, speeding up the scans. And the software has a number of built-in inspections that really set it apart. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a look. I've got a short video here on the CT and a nice introduction to it. And so uh, here's our CT and uh, our lovely model. Hallie can be seen loading in uh, a specimen. She's gonna open up the CT doors and she's gonna load in an animal bone that we have here. It's uh, on a foam fixturing. So we're just using foam here. It's easy to set apart that foam from the bone, uh, just very different densities there. And uh, uh, so we actually use a roadkill animal bone here. None of our colleagues would lend us a cadaver bone. Um, once activated, you can see the CT automatically will position the part. We've got a webcam inside the CT, so you guys can be brought in on the inside and see what happens. Um, we'll begin uh, by putting it in position and begin scanning right away. You can see we've sped up the tape here, but uh, it was just over four minutes to scan the entire bone. This bone is about 13 inches, about 330 millimeters. So this is quite fast and you can see it spins around and it's taking photos, x-rays. Once scanned, um, we can uh, get a nice look at it here and sort of spin around. This is our software. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and construct a plane and uh, a viewing plane in which we can do some fly-throughs. And, and um, you can see here, kind of turn, turn on the side and, and drag this plane through uh, the specimen and uh, that cross-sectional data can tell you quite a bit about um, uh, the, the specimen, the bone here. So we actually scanned the, the same bone again after drilling a small hole into it. You can see the small hole there and look for the hole again in this scan. You'll see it pop up at the very top right there. There it is. <laughs> we did another fly through to look at that hole and the surrounding material. Um, it's a perfectly drilled empty space uh, with no effect on the surrounding area. Uh, our, our thought was that we would drill and, and get some, some residual changes in the structures around it. But this is a boiled bone and it was very brittle. And uh, the scan re still resulted in some really nice high resolution images, as you can see there. An inside look reveals the structures prevalent through, throughout a bone. Look at uh, all these caverns inside there. You can see where we drilled on there too. One of the inspections available in our software allows us for the volumetric analysis of voids, where we can actually uh, look into the volume of those voids as uh, the template shows. We can even take a slice of the bone material and look at the average thickness displayed. Uh, that's really useful when analyzing fracture repair, for instance. So that's a kind of a nice introduction to our CT and hopefully uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'd like now to focus on a motion analysis project with a spine that brings together a lot of the themes uh, from today and incorporates both the Aramis and the CT together. Um, and so we've seen a lot of testing 
uh, with consideration of implants into the spine. As, uh, we work with many hospitals that uh, consider this for uh, 3D printing of vertebrae, even uh, discs. And so um, the, the following test was to analyze vertebrae of the spine and to understand the motion of a normal spine. Spines are impressive structures in terms of flexibility and stability, and they transfer the load and undergo various motions and rotations. And so having the Aramis being able to uh, capture it all is, is going to be great. So let's, let's take a look. So here's the video uh, that we captured of the spine motion. You can see target dots were applied directly onto the soft tissue that's overlaying the vertebrae bones and onto the fixture as well. So you can see them even on the arms of the fixture. And so remember, these are just lightweight dots that were sticking on there that the software automatically identifies and tracks as 3D coordinates. Uh, there's also pins that we stuck stuck into the spine, and you can see in the zoomed in photo here on the upper right, the target dots were applied to the pins. These pins give us structures that move in the same way as the individual vertebra uh, that wouldn't otherwise be visible, right? So uh, with the target dots on the pins, we now have information representative of the vertebra bones inside the spine. This is re uh, really kind of cool. So we've got three different sets here of dots. And after we, we acquire the images, we sort of uh, cluster them together and select them and create different point components for the motion analysis. So these clusters of target dots, uh, we'll look at the vertebra individually uh, or together, or uh, we even have a special interest in this case to investigate the relative motion between uh, two different vertebra. And we'll be looking at vertebra one and vertebra two for that, uh, uh, that investigation. So with GOM, there's, uh, there's always this capability of importing in other data for alignment, uh, CAD data, FEA data. Uh, you saw before we brought in the, the scanned mesh data. In this case, we're bringing in the CT scan data. And here, um, when we bring it in and align it with our project for tracking, it, it, you can see the coordinate system is brought in with it too. So there's a really nice visualization for us to, to be able to see what's occurring. Um, but it also allows us to track things that we wouldn't otherwise see. Points displayed in red are used as a reference. The very bottom there, you can see it. Uh, for it's, it's used as reference for the motion of the whole test setup, and it's going to become our rigid body motion compensation. I mentioned that before. Uh, and then this way, we have the motion of the spine isolated from the fixture. In the video now, you can see the inspections. So you have these vectors, uh, 3D vector displacements on each of the target dots. And uh, it's a nice overview of the whole spine here and uh, each of the vertebra and how they move relative to the bottom fixture during the test. On each of the vertebra, we place, we place a local coordinate system and so that we can inspect for the six degrees of freedom. And you can see here where we're, we're uh, looking at those reference positions, and then we take into consideration the motion between them. Uh, to take that step one step further, um, we're inspecting the rotation in the x direction for each vertebra, one and two. Remember, I said we're going to look at the first, the top two vertebra. This is their roll rotation. And through a custom inspection in our software, we have the capability to make a unique measurement of the difference in rotations. So, um, it, it, the difference between the two, that is, is that red line there. And um, it's automatically calculated throughout the test in our software. So uh, I think it does a good job on the left-hand side pointing out that red line and how it's being calculated between the two local coordinate systems. Using that information, this type of uh, advanced inspection, we can now uh, combine it with the CT data. Uh, so aligning with the scan data with the spine, we have an automatic calculation of the position for each vertebra. And uh, you can see their, their movement here embedded in that, uh, that positioning. And so we can then calculate, and this is very, very cool, um, we can calculate the distance between the vertebrae as well as determine the dynamic disc thickness throughout the test. And if you look at the color map here on the vertebra, it's actually showing the distance to the upper vertebra so it's, this is the second one uh, measured in relation to the, the top vertebra. And it's calculated as we move through the image series of the test. And so that we can see how uh, that disc th thickness is, is affected as uh, the spine is, is moved in the fixture 
So this is really, really cool. It's, it really does pull it all together, pulls together the CT data and the ARMS data, uh, measuring what we can see with uh, uh, what we had previously scanned and an understanding of that disk thickness. Pretty cool project. Um, I'm happy to be proud of, proud to be part of that. Um, there are a number of projects that I've not gotten to show you today. Uh, these are the ones that we went through today, but often our projects are driven by customers. And uh, so please reach out with any questions to more critically understand 3D optical metrology. And, and um, we'd love to be able to uh, help you to uh, learn more about the technology, its limitations and what it might be able to do for you. Uh, but please remember these takeaways from the presentation. You know, we're highly precise so that we have the ability to detect micro motion. We saw that with Elise. Um, we're non-contact, so there's no influence on the specimen. We can detect the six degrees of freedom. We should just show that really nicely with the spine. We can definitely look at the relative motion between components. Uh, we saw that uh, with, uh, with the spine as well. Um, we have the ability to, we didn't get too much into it, but we can get into high cycle fatigue and we can align with uh, other types of data, whether it be for a coordinate system or to see things that we sometimes or otherwise could not see. Uh, please go download the free software at gome-correlate.com where you can access 3D sample projects and, and uh, learn more about the types of inspections you can make. And thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Great, thank you both. Um, we do have some a question here. This is for Justin. Does does Aramis create those three D meshes of the sample parts being tested, or were those created in some other software and uploaded? Yeah, so the the three D meshes that we brought in for the hammer and the impactor you saw previously were scanned by an ATOS. That's a GOM ATOS that we scan we used to scan. And uh, so we scanned the parts and we brought them into the Aramis project. The Aramis uh, project was for the, uh, we tacked the mesh onto the, the target dots and we were able to track the mesh throughout that project using Aramis. What is the accuracy of Aramis? Uh, I guess the, probably an, an easy way to think of it, uh, and it's a little loose, but uh, for a meter, field of view, we, we uh, have a sensitivity uh, or resolution of uh, about uh, 20 microns. And at 100 millimeters, we would have a, a sensitivity or resolution of uh, two microns. And uh, we're gonna be much more accurate than say other conventional sensors because we're, uh, we don't have any kind of user variability. We, we are non-contact. So we're gonna come closest to the actual values that you should see and um, through third-party testing, we've been shown to be more accurate. Um, but yeah, um, hopefully that gives you an understanding of our resolution, our sensitivity. Sometimes these words are thrown around a little bit, um, but uh, hopefully that does well. What is the precision of the GOM CT scanner? Uh, it's gonna have, a, a, it can go down to 1.2 micron resolution. And uh, we saw it had a, an accuracy of a three micron uh, deviation. You know, just a general question, you know, potentially for both of you, how do you recommend staying up to date on what's happening in biomechanical testing? Well, I, I, I could probably go first. Uh, uh, maybe Elise has a different answer for, for us. Um, we stay on top of things largely through uh, direct customer contact. We have a lot of notable customers that uh, are, are on the front lines doing really amazing things. And so we hear a lot from them as to what they're trying to do and uh, how we can help them. So we, we learn a lot that way. Um, but I would say um, I, I read a lot of uh, white papers, research papers, and uh, try to stay up to date as best as possible through uh, colleagues. And I follow a lot of really cool researchers to try and stay up on it. Yeah, I mean, I would have a similar response that for the most part, it's staying up on the literature and seeing what other people have done. Um, is primarily how I make sure that we're staying up to date on what others are doing. 
how is the speckled pattern applied to the soft tissue? And if spray painted, are there best practices for preventing tissue drying artifacts? So you can use uh, just standard spray paint. We've used it on spines before or soft tissues before and it's worked. Sometimes you have a solution where you might need to mix in uh, powders or um, use some, some sort of uh, a different type of uh, stain to get, get yourself a pattern. And there's a, a lot of different ways to go about this, um, but it, it sounds like intimidating uh, to do, but it's actually uh, quite easily. Uh, and, and that's because the software works well on any kind of contrasting pattern. Oftentimes uh, you can track things already because they'll have a pattern to them. Uh, we pattern with spray paint, uh, airbrush, and uh, uh, aluminum oxide of, of different sizes. And we find ways to, to optimize our tracking methodology, uh, our pattern methodology. But a lot of times we can just track it uh, already. Great. Well, thank you both. I think we are going to wrap it up there. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Elise, for sharing your expertise and experience. For the audience, you have their contact information if you have more questions. Certainly want to uh, thank Trillian for sponsoring and speaking during this webinar. And of course, want to thank everyone who attended today. Uh, I think the discussion provided great examples of how the technology works. And I really appreciate how both of you walked through specific orthopedic applications for our, for our audience. Of course, we would like to hear the audience thoughts as well on the presentation. So attendees, you will be receiving a link to a survey asking for your thoughts about today's webinar. And additionally, you will receive an email with a link to access this webinar on demand. Thank you both so much. Uh, again, thank you everybody for attending. I hope you have a great day.